Somebody asked me out in the lobby if I had water. I have this one. I have this one. There might be another one up here somewhere. About point two, we'll have intermission so I can go to the bathroom. Uh, and so uh, I'll do my best to kind of get us through this this morning. And I appreciate your patience and, and your prayers as well. I did stay home on Wednesday. I, I really, Brother Trevon had been here last week and it wasn't Mother's Day. Uh, would have stayed last week. And I probably ought not be here today either, but I feel like I need to be. And uh, next week, pray for Sonia and I will be. I usually don't say anything when I'm going to leave, but I'm going to count on all of you to just be faithful and be in your place. Uh, and so I'll be preaching at Lighthouse Baptist Church in Cortez, Colorado next Sunday morning for Memorial Day. And uh, occasionally I get, uh, and we'll have veteran Brother Mike will be preaching here next Sunday morning. Um, and have a veteran on days like that preach, and I'll get invited rarely. But, uh, but I, I wasn't going to say no because our, our youngest daughter works at that church and her husband. We haven't been there since they got married and moved there, so it's our first trip to see them uh, since they got married last year in May. And so pray for us as we will leave in the morning and take two days to drive it. It's about 17 or 18 hours of driving. Um, and so, and then we'll be, uh, we'll be back by the next Sunday. Uh, so I don't like to be gone more than one Sunday if I can help it. Uh, and so we appreciate your prayers as we travel. And prayer that this will, will clear up and not be too much distraction. But <coughs> it, it does flare up when I'm speaking from time to time. And so <coughs> I, I wish you could have seen uh, Tamika a while ago when we started the handshaking time. And I didn't know that she could move that fast when she was getting past me. Uh, and so I'm, 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 I, I said I wouldn't be offended, but I've never seen her move that way, and I'm offended. And I'm just, I'm just kidding. Uh, and so I'd, I'd be, I'd be moving too. Uh, and so take your Bibles this morning to Luke's Gospel, chapter number eleven. Luke's Gospel, chapter eleven. We've already seen this a few weeks ago on Sunday night in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, and what we look at the tail end of this passage we're going to address from the standpoint of the Sermon on the Mount tonight uh, as we get back into that. It's interesting, Luke and Matthew, Matthew was there, Luke was not. Matthew includes it in the Sermon on the Mount. Luke it doesn't give us that account of the Sermon on the Mount and it's, it's pulled away. There's not as much information in between the last part of this discourse on prayer and the first part. I'll, I'll clear that up as we read it. I think you've got verses 1 through 4 in your notes. We're going to actually read down through verse number 10 just for the context and to help support where we're going tonight. And so uh, as we look at this this morning, Luke chapter 11 and verse 1, And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. And he said unto them, When ye pray, say, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so on earth. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That same segment of verses, almost word for word, if not word for word, is found in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6. Then in Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord Jesus goes into several other things and, and takes us through several different things. And then in chapter 7, and verse, about verse 7 or so, he picks up with what Luke is giving us here in verse number 9. So he begins immediately after this, deliver us from evil to the parable of the importunate friend, uh, someone that is great need. And then in verse 9, he says, And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receiveth. He that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Now, I'm not going to get that far this morning. We're going to go back to Matthew and deal with that tonight. But we're going to learn what it is to seek, to find, and to knock. But we have to understand these first four verses before that matters. Uh, it's interesting that Jesus states this in the Sermon on the Mount, but here it's clear that they've seen him and heard him pray. 
So as they've seen him and heard him pray, it sparked an interest in them. And so clearly Jesus taught them more than once, essentially the same thing. And in this case, at their, at their request. And so we're going to look at this thought this morning. Uh, and again, this is, this is really basic Christianity. Uh, I hope it'll encourage and uh, remind and perhaps instruct some uh, on the thought of just learning to pray biblically. Now let's pray and we'll go Lord and, and ask to meet with us. Heaven, Father in heaven, uh, Lord, as you sit on your throne this morning and you look down, we know that you promised that when we gather together in your name that Lord Jesus, you'll be with us. Certainly the Holy Spirit, you're here in our hearts. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to glean the, the, the truth that you have for us this morning. I pray that you'd help us to be growing in our faith. Help us to evaluate our, our relationship with you and Lord, to be encouraged. And Lord, may we learn to pray that we might have answer to prayer, that we might feel your presence in prayer, that we might, uh, Lord, know what it is to walk and to please you. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> Excuse me. And so again, he says here, as it came to pass, as he was praying a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. So I, I, I don't know if you've ever been, I think a lot of us have been in times where we've been around someone and when we heard them pray, it just convicted our heart. I don't know if you've ever experienced that. I've been places where it wasn't in a public setting as far as like someone necessarily, occasionally someone leading a public prayer. But for the most part, it's been in a private prayer meeting where maybe there was a group of men, uh, maybe that was a, a group uh, that were, were, were people were paired off. But when they prayed, you just felt the presence of the Lord settle in. And you didn't experience that when you prayed. And you didn't experience that when maybe half of the other people in the room prayed. Or maybe even anyone else in the room prayed. But when that person prayed, it was like the Lord just showed up and, and declared himself present and powerful and engaged. That's the prayer life that every Christian should experience every day. That ought not be abnormal. And, and we, we live accepting abnormal Christianity because it's the only Christianity that we know. And I, I would say to us this morning that most of us will seldom, if ever, engage in a relationship with Christ that is the life that Christ intended for every believer to have with him every moment of the day. And the, the time in which we live, there are just so many distractions. Work is busy. It takes both, both partners in a marriage oftentimes working because the housing costs are so high these days. And it, in most places, it's getting to that point where unless both of you are, are, are working, you can't make ends meet. And that's destructive to the home. That's not, that's not the environment that God instituted. Uh, that's not what God's intent is. I'm not telling you live in poverty and, and only one of you work. I'm just telling you that what we have come to know as normal is not the normal that God intended. And, and we accept that. It, the Bible is to the Christian beyond important. And there are elements of the Christian life from where there are things that God has given us in which those things are of utmost and vital importance. And without them, we'll never become what God wants us to be. We'll never know God the way God wants us to know him. We'll never experience God the way that he wants us to experience him. The Bible is to our spirit, water and nourishment. The, the Bible oftentimes in, in, in scripture, uh, is, it, it refers to itself as water, the water of the word. And we, we make that analogy and we see it in Ephesians chapter 5 and verses 25 and 26. He concludes by saying that he might sanctify and cleanse us and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Uh, and so the word of God cleanses us. The word of God washes us and, and keeps us in harmony with the Lord. In John chapter 1 and verse 1, Jesus said, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Jesus Christ is the Word of God. He is not just talked about and taught about in the Word of God. 
the Bible is Christ in print. It is the manifestation of, as Jesus is the manifestation of God in human flesh, the Word of God is the manifestation of God in print. And it's tangible. We hold it in our hands. And John 15, 3 said, Now ye are clean through the Word which I have spoken unto you. And so again, the cleansing power of the word. In John chapter 6 and verse 35, and Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. In verse 48, he said, I am that bread of life. In verse 51, he said, I am the living word. Uh, and he makes it clear that the Bible is the essence of Christ. The word of God is essential to the Christian life. You cannot be what God would have you to be apart from the truths that are revealed to us about Christ and his word. Not only is the word of God essential to the Christian life, but the preaching of the word of God is essential to the Christian life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 18, uh, Paul said that for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. The preaching of the word of God is not a nicety. It is essential. I cannot maintain the relationship that I need to have with God without the preaching of the word of God. Well, pastor, I can study. I can learn on my own. I can do this and you can and you should. But it doesn't replace the preaching of God's word. It doesn't replace the coming together as the body of Christ. The church is essential uh, to the Christian life. We don't come simply because it's a nice thing to do. We come because it's essential to our walk with God. It's essential to growing in his grace. You, you may say, well, uh, you know, the church doesn't do much for me. Well, if, if you're to that point in your Christian life where, where you really legitimately get nothing out of coming together with God's people to worship, then God's people need you. But the truth of the matter is, is that we all need this this morning. We, we need to come together and to assemble. And he told us not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. And we live in a time where churches are meeting less and less when the Bible tells us that we should assemble more and more. Now, I'm not advocating that we uh, get into a realm where, hey, we go to church seven days a week. But I'm just saying this morning, we need more, not less, of Christ, of the preached word, of the word of God in our heart. <coughs> Excuse me, and of prayer. But of all of the essentials, prayer is paramount. Without it, we have no real connection to God. And our prayer, even when we learn how to pray biblically, tends to drift over time. Prayer becomes one-sided. Prayer becomes all about, God, this is what I need. Oh, I rejoice and praise God that I can go boldly before the throne of grace. And so, my wife, bless her heart, she's from Puerto Rico, and the solution to every ailment in Puerto Rico is Vicks. And so, I, she can't get me to let her rub it on my chest, but she gave me cough drops that are, that are laced with Vicks, and it doesn't mix that well with water. <coughs> and so, it will light you up. Uh, and so, uh, bear with me for a minute. Uh, but prayer, our prayer will tend to drift. Uh, it gets out of balance. God wants us to bring our request to him. There's no question about that. God cares about the burdens of our life and God cares about answering our needs and meeting our needs. Uh, God cares about all of those things, but our prayer life should be balanced to the model that Jesus gives us. We refer to this passage oftentimes as the Lord's Prayer, which really is not theologically accurate. The Lord's Prayer was in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was praying before he went to Calvary's cross. Uh, this is a model prayer. Uh, this is Jesus instruction, instructing us. This is step one, two, three, four, and how to pray. What is it that draws us and brings us into God's presence? And we need to be uh, well-versed in that. And I'll listen this morning. Religion puts a huge emphasis on prayer as a right, as necessary to obtain, uh, to obtain the possibility of salvation or uh, forgiveness of sin. I'm not saying that we shouldn't seek forgiveness of sin in prayer. I'm saying that if I view prayer as a right of religious activity, <coughs> I'm really not accomplishing anything 
by spewing a bunch of verbiage out into the air. Uh, what, what God is talking about in prayer is a conversation. God, like every father, longs to have conversation with his children. He wants a meaningful discourse, not just, uh, a, you know, a, a young child will come and is all about, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, I want to play, I want to go here, I want to do this, I want to do that. As they advance and mature into adulthood, you would hope that there's some back and forth in the conversation, that there's some, uh, there's some care about what maybe your needs are uh, as a parent or what, uh, what your likes are. What your, it's not a selfish prayer, in other words. It's not children are, in, are, are just by nature selfish and they just care about, hey, this is what I need or what I want. And oftentimes that's the way we go to God in prayer. That's not the prayer life that God uh, has given us. And so Jesus in this passage and in the Sermon on the Mount is transitioning their thinking on every aspect of their identity in God and their relationship with God. And that includes their prayer life with God. Prayer should be an intimate personal exchange between a father and his child. Nowhere until the New Testament when, Jesus, when, when the Jewish mind thought of going to God in prayer, would it ever enter their mind to address God as Father? That would have, that would have been almost blasphemy to their way of thinking. To, to think that I can go to the God of heaven that created the heavens and the earth and that I could call out to him and call him Father is beyond their understanding. Why did Jesus have to explain this in a couple of different ways and times to his disciples throughout the New Testament. Matthew records it in the Sermon on the Mount. Luke is recording almost word for word here after a time where Jesus was in prayer and the disciples heard him praying and are blown away by what they just heard, by what they just experienced in listening to Jesus pray. Why is that so difficult for them? There's little doubt that the disciples had some understanding of prayer. I don't think... <coughs> that any Jew that was, that was coming up in that time in history would have not understood some basic concepts of going to God in prayer and to offering uh, prayer up to God uh, and for different things and sacrifice and uh, different ways of being. And so it's not foreign to their concept. Not the idea of prayer. What's foreign to their concept is the idea that God is my father. And that I can go to him and say, Abba, Father. Abba literally means Daddy. To go with that close, personal, intimate relationship and cry out to God in such a way. It's personal. It's intimate. It's like crawling up into the lap of God and putting your head on his chest. And just pouring your heart out to all your needs and heartaches and your cares. But it doesn't change the fact that he's still almighty God. Amen. That almighty God would desire such a relationship with you and with me is almost too hard to understand. Yeah. But that's what Jesus shares with us here. And he tells them. And he just says it like, you know, it's not that big of a thing for you to comprehend. Oh, you want to learn how to pray? Okay, come here. I'll tell you, he already told the crowd. He already heard them tell the crowd. Now the disciples come intimately and are like, man, Jesus, you got to teach us how to pray like you pray. And he says, oh, you want to pray? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And so he just goes down through the discourse here and begins to share. Teach us to pray like you. Teach us to pray like John. Some of them had heard John pray in a way that captivated them, that shook them, that caused them to stop and to seek. And so they saw a demonstration. They saw a demonstration first with John, now with Jesus, that causes them to reflect and to want something more, to causes them to understand that, that hey, I desire, and what they're expressing here is a desire to pray like Jesus prayed. Desire is a powerful thing. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 1 says, Through desire, a man having separated himself, seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. And so what causes someone to get focused? 
What causes an athlete to get committed to, to becoming the best at their, at their sport, at their event? It's desire. And desire causes them to separate from anything that's a distraction. Desire causes them to train harder, to push their bodies, to think about the impact of everything that's going on in their day. It impacts the way that they sleep and their sleep goals and their, and their nutrition goals. <coughs> it's important to them. Why? Because they desire to be the very best. They desire it enough that it impacts their life. The, the, the disciples desired Christ enough and desired this relationship with God enough that they were willing to come to him and say, teach us to pray. And what we see, first of all, this morning is this. And this is really simple this morning. This is a very simple outline. Uh, it's not going to be too hard to follow along. Prayer is worship. Prayer is worship. Prayer is not just about me going boldly before the throne of God and saying, okay, God, I need you to bail me out of this problem. Prayer starts with worship. Genuine prayer that pleases God starts with acknowledging who God is. Is he my father? Yes, but he's also God. I'm my father in heaven, God, hallowed be thy name. Your name is sacred. And prayer that pleases the Lord starts with acknowledging God. Mr. Pastor, what does that look like in a practical, in a practical setting? It would sound something like this. Dear Father in heaven that created all that is. It may, dear Father in heaven that hung the sun and the moon and the stars in place. It doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to be a long list of things, but it's acknowledging. It's acknowledging Yes, you're my father and I'm here in your presence, but I haven't forgotten that you're God. I haven't forgotten that you are the one that I worship. So what do we see here? Again, just basically is we see an acknowledging of God. Do I acknowledge him? How often do we go to the Lord in prayer and we just say, okay, God, dear Lord, I need you to help me with this. Dear Lord, I need you to heal me. Dear Lord, I need you to intervene. Dear Lord, would you please do this? Instead of stopping and just soaking in for a moment, the fact that the God of this universe has not only allowed us into his presence, but he allows us in boldly and personally. My Father, acknowledge that. Genuine prayer acknowledges God. And Genuine prayer reverences the name of God. Make much of the names of God. Learn the names of God. Learn what they mean. Learn Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nissi. Learn the, the Je Jehovah, learn Adonai, learn Elohim. Learn that God is my that I am, that he's my creator, that he's my banner, that he's my provider, all of those things. God has many names through the scripture. And it's not because he, he can't make up his mind as to what he wants to be called. He's revealing to us the essence of his power and what's available to us in the person of God and the Lord Jesus Christ for our lives. They had a, saw a demonstration. They had a desire and then they received direction. And Jesus, again, he comes in just very simply. He doesn't make it complicated. There's a, a, a quote, I forget exactly who said it, but it's a well-known old, he's been in heaven a lot of years, decades. Uh, let your, let your, your prayer be without words rather than without heart. It's not about a long, prolonged, it's not that it's inappropriate to have long seasons of prayer at times. But a long season of prayer is not necessary to find the power of God and to connect with him. And Jesus doesn't give a long drawn out thing here. Jesus gives a short, succinct outline of how to pray. Prayer is worship. Am I coming to my father with an attitude of worshiping him? Secondly, we see that prayer is surrender. Notice in verse number two. 
And he said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done as in heaven, so on earth. <coughs> what do we see here? What we see this, first of all, is that I'm putting God's will first. See, we come to God in prayer like this. Father, I, I, I need your direction today. I need you to help me with this today. I need your healing today. What Jesus is teaching them is to say this. Father, great God of heaven, your will be done. And what he's expressing is a surrender. So much in our Christian life derails because we do not surrender to God. We want God to surrender to our will. We, want, we say we're going to walk with God, but what we really mean is that we want God to walk with us. We want to go do what we're going to do and ask God to tag along. Rather than coming to God and saying, God, Father, what would you have me do? What's your will for my life today? Well, Pastor, but I have to go to work in the morning. I've got to be there at 7 or 8 or whenever. I understand. God gave you that job. You are following the will of God when you go and do what God's given you to do for your life's work to provide for your family. But are you asking God along the way, Lord, what's your will for me today? Who would you have me speak to today? What opportunities would I look for today? How can I, how can I manage my, my issues today? Would you help me manage my anger or my, uh, or my frustration level or my this or my that or whatever it is, the sin that so easily besets you? As I pray for the sin that so easily besets me, what's your will? Father, your will be done. But pastor, what about your will? His will's first. And if I, if I come to God with the understanding that I am surrendering to him, he is God. He is my father. So he is my authority first as my creator, and then he's my authority secondly as my father. How dare I come to him and demand anything? I come to him grateful that I'm permitted into his presence, humbled by the fact that God would see me. And I want to make it clear that as I, I'm here to worship you, what would you have me do? I'm surrendered to you. It's not that it's wrong for me to ask my needs. He, he gets to that. But it has to come in the right context. And the context of a surrendered heart, the context of a surrendered life, the context that's not looking at God as, as a genie in a bottle that is just someone that I can get something from, but he is a God who is worthy of my worship and my service of the sacrifice of my very life, a living sacrifice for his glory. And we, we say, oh, I'm surrendered to God, Pastor. I want to live for God. I want to be that living sacrifice. When's the last time you stopped in prayer and said, Father, I'm surrendered to you. What would you have me do? Not only... Is it acknowledging God and reverencing his name and putting his will first, but it's then putting by default my needs and desires second. Daily acknowledging God's order in life. And that's essentially what Jesus is stating here. What's he laying out? He's laying out a dynamic in which the very act of prayer is following and acknowledging God's design for my day. He's first. He's preeminent. I'm yielded to him. My needs are second. And I come to him, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. As in heaven, so on earth. Give us day by day our daily bread. Now I ask for my needs. But I want you to notice it. See, we come to God and we just ask for our needs. Now my needs are in the context of his will. When I'm yielded to him, it puts my needs in the context of his will. I, I cannot, I, I'm frustrated because God won't answer my prayer, but I'm asking for things for God to answer. I'm, I'm putting things out there for God to answer that are contrary to his will. Why would I expect God to answer something that's contrary to his will? But when I go to God in the right manner, as Jesus taught, and I'm yielded to him, and I see my needs, my needs come in the context of a surrendered heart to God. Your will's first. God, I, I need this need today. Now I'm praying. 
my daily bread. Uh, we need to eat. We need the lights on. Getting to that time of the year, we need the air conditioning to work. Uh, we need gas for our cars. We need, uh, we need uh, you know, the ability to uh, go and do the things that we need to do. Pray for those things. But pray for them with a surrendered heart to God. It is a prayer of surrender. Thirdly, we see that it's a prayer of dependence. And forgive us our sins, for we forgive everyone. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Give us day by day our daily bread. We're dependent upon him. <coughs> We're not dependent upon self. If, if I'm able to go to work, God gave me the strength and the health to go. I have a job that God gave me. Everything that I have, everything that I obtain, I have as the mercy and the grace of God. Uh, and, if, and if I see it that way, it has meaningful, it's meaningful to me. And if I don't see it that way, I miss out on God's blessings in life. Prayer is surrender, his will first, then mine. Then prayer is dependence. And I, I'm not going to belabor this, not even a sub point to this, other than to say, I'm dependent upon God for everything. For everything. Especially that's really simple. Yeah, the Christian life is generally pretty simple. We complicate it, but the Lord really didn't complicate it that much. It's really basic. It, I'm, I depend on God for the next breath that I draw is dependent upon God. The next beat of my heart is a gift from God. The, the next place that I go, the next thing that I do, I, it, I am dependent upon God for everything that comes my way. Then fourthly, you see that prayer is cleansing. Prayer is cleansing. Notice in verse number four, he says, And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. In other words, God, forgive me for my sins as I forgive everyone that has wronged me. I've wronged you. Forgive me. I'm forgiving those that have wronged me. Why is that so important? Why do you put that in there that way? How could I, how bold do I have to be to come to God and say, God, forgive me, but I'm not going to forgive that person over there that did this to me. I put you on Calvary's cross, but this person hurt my feelings, but I'm not going to forgive them. I put, I sent you to, to, to the grave. I caused you to be hung and your blood to be shed for my sin. But so-and-so was talking about me and I'm not going to forgive that. But pastor, what about the egregious things? My spouse betrayed me. This person attacked me. My family member was murdered. All of these horrible things that can come about. I'm not going to forgive that. Listen, Jesus paid for every sin. And he says to us, come to God seeking forgiveness for sin, understanding that if I'm not willing to forgive, I'm never really going to experience genuine, full, complete forgiveness from the Lord. Not because he won't forgive me, but because I'm hanging on. It's not an, a matter of will God forgive and forget. Yeah, God forgives and forgets, but I'm still crushed being past feeling, living in the past, with things that God has put away because I won't. And he's just, he's just simply saying to them, listen, forgive, learn to forgive. God's forgiving you. Come seeking forgiveness. Come drawing out to him. Seek forgiveness. Forgive others. This is basic Christian principle. It should be the natural act of the forgiven. Forgiving one another even of very grievous sins should be the natural act of those that have been forgiven. Here's why it's hard for us. It's hard for me too, by the way. But here's why it's hard for us, in my opinion. We don't see our offense against God as great as the offenses that have been committed against us. <coughs> Excuse me. And until I understand that my offense hurt God more than that other person's offense hurt me. I'll never live free. I'll always be under that burden. And Jesus is trying to help us see that point. As we learn to pray, it should be natural without having to be asked. Well, I would forgive them if they asked me. No, you won't. If you would have forgiven them if they asked, you would have already forgiven them. And it's not that it's not still appropriate for them to come and say, please forgive me. 
But it's a matter of whether you ask or not, you're forgiven. And to truly forgive someone doesn't mean that the scar isn't there or that the wound isn't there or that it's still not difficult to process. Forgiving someone for a deep wound may require me to be forgiving them on a regular basis for a really long time. But it is the act of I am choosing to forgive, which means that I have to choose to treat you as if you've never offended me. I'm not talking about what I'm harboring in my heart, what I'm struggling to get over. I can take that to God in prayer, but I need to be purposeful in forgiving those that have wronged me because my offense against Christ was far greater than anything everyone could ever do to me. But pastor, but that person literally did this very horrible thing. Have you done something that bad to you? Have you done something that bad to God? Listen, their crime against me did not take my life. My crime against Christ took his life. He gave it for me. He loves me. And if you want to live free, be cleansed. Cleansing requires letting go. It requires giving it to God fully. And then fifthly, we see as he draws to a close uh, that prayer is daily guidance from the Holy Spirit. He says unto him uh, here, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. What's he saying here? Lord, guide my steps. Guide my steps. Lead me away from that which is evil or temptation. Listen, God sometimes will lead you into temptation. Testing. Not temptation to sin, but testing, to, but to be tested. The Holy Spirit led Jesus to the mountain to be tempted of the devil. It was the, it, it, it proves us. It grows our faith. It's not that he's trying to trip us up. He's trying to strengthen us and cause us to rely upon him. But God is not going to lead me to sin. God is not going to tempt me with sin. Will God put me in a position where my faith is tested at times? Perhaps someone else that's watching needs to see that faith so that they're drawn to Christ. I don't have to understand his reasoning. I don't have to have all of the answers. I have to trust my father who is God and that he loves me and I've got to yield to him and I need to seek his direction. I wonder how many of us start our day, Lord, guide me. Lord, lead me, guide my words, guide my thoughts. Help me say the right thing. Help me respond in a way that glorifies you when I'm confronted with the gross sin that's thrown in my face every day on the job. It's not going to get better. But our response needs to become better. How we handle it needs to be Christ honoring without compromise. But, but you know, there was a day and age where most people in, in, in the society thought of, uh, of, of much of the sin that's being pushed in, on the culture today uh, as, as being something that was not acceptable, not something that was to be tolerated, not something that was to be accepted. And, and you could, you could, somebody could push an agenda and you could say, oh, I can't believe that. And, and you could kind of go off on a rant and then you'd get an amen. And now people just get offended and it turns them off to Christ. Well, I don't want to compromise my position, but I want to respond in a way that provokes conversation to lead people to the gospel. Uh, and so that, that's a, a difficult, that's a difficult task. How am I going to do that, Pastor? That's why we pray for the Holy Spirit to lead us. That's why we pray for his guidance. Jesus just comes and says, listen, I, the disciples come to him and say, teach us to pray. What does he say? Prayers worship. Worship your father. Acknowledge God. Reverence his name. It's surrender. It's his will first and then yours. Trust him. Depend upon him to meet your needs. Ask for those needs to be met. Go to God. With a, with a prayer of those things. Understand that you need your heart cleansed. Prayer is cleansing. Prayer is cleansing my heart from sin. It is not, I said, Pastor, I've trusted Christ as my Savior. So <clears throat> now that I'm a Christian, my sin is a child that's disobedient, that needs to be corrected. It doesn't impact my relationship with God. He's still my father, but it does impact his blessing, his empowerment, his closeness to us, I need to make that right. I need to go and get forgiveness and cleansing. I've been out in the world all day. I, I got up yesterday and I, I'm, I, with all the rain 
and the way I've been feeling, I haven't, haven't mowed and uh, I needed to get it knocked out. And so I got up yesterday. It was so bad that I had to mow it twice. And so I got all the weed eating done and then I raised it up and I mowed it and I lowered it and I mowed it again. And when I came in, I stunk. It smelled like a wet dog being outside. I went to go take a shower. Get out in the world and the stench of the world will be on your Christian life. Get cleansed. That's essentially what he's saying. Cleanse, ask God for cleansing. But prayer is cleansing. And prayer is daily guidance from the Holy Spirit. Lead me not into temptation. Lord, lead me away from adversity. He may not always, but it's not wrong to ask. It's not God's will for every day to be an easy day. But it's okay to ask for an easy day. It's okay to ask for God to help me find that way of escape when real temptation comes and I'm tempted to sin. It's deliverance from evil. Prayer is not a ritual. And so often and in so many religious circles, prayer is nothing more than a ritual. And you go to some religions and it's almost like a chant. You say the same words every time. Every, listen, prayer is not ritualistic. It's an intimate conversation between a father and his child. God wants to have an intimate relationship with you. He wants it to be close. He wants it to be personal. He wants his sons and his daughter to draw up close and put their arm around them. I, I came back from the office on, on Friday, and, uh, or Sonia and I were out somewhere together. I don't remember exactly what it was. And we came in, and two of our grandsons were there. This rarely happens. But both the grandsons, one's three and a half, and the other one's about 18 months, they come and they're making a beeline for her. And right when they got to her, they went around her and came to me. That was awesome. It was really awesome because she was there to witness it. But it was awesome because it rarely happens. Usually I'm chopped liver and they go to her. And it was awesome. And it just melts your heart. I got up yesterday and uh, my, the three-year-old grandson, he typically is really... You never know what you're going to get in the morning. And he either doesn't want anything to do with you. Well, yesterday I came out of the room and he come and he sticks his arms up and he wants to be held. Hey, man, that's awesome. How much more does it please our Father in heaven? When we get up in the morning and we come to our Father in heaven, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I want up. That's what my grandson says. I want up, up. Father, I want, I want up. I don't need you to come down. I need you to lift me up to where you are. I need you to put me in your lap. I, I need to acknowledge your godness, your holiness, your power. But you're not a distant God. You're not unapproachable. You love me. You care for me. Prayer's not a religion or a, a, a ritual. It's an intimate conversation in which a Christian seeks and acknowledges and surrenders to his Father's will. And when we do that, God is glorified. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verses 19 and 20. He says, What know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. In chapter 7, beginning verse 20, says, Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. Art thou called being a servant? Care not for it. But if thou mayest be made free, use it rather. For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's freeman. Likewise also he that is called being free is Christ's servant. Ye are bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. Brethren, let every man Wherein he is called, therein abide with God. Where should I be as a child of God? Abiding with my Father. Abiding in his presence. I need to be at his feet. I need to be in his lap. I need to be in his presence. He's with me. And he loves me. And he loves you. Do I desire that relationship with God enough that I would come to Jesus and say, Lord, teach me to pray. 
got books in my office. Some of them are that thick on prayer. When Jesus was asked, teach me to pray, he taught them in four verses. It's not complicated. Do I desire to be in his presence?